I remember walking down there because it's a long, long house. And I look up and I'm like, oh, mom, what's that? Because I see this chandelier. I'm like, oh, mom, what's that? And she's like, oh, um, those are skulls. And I'm like, oh, what's a skull? And it's like, oh, it's the heads of dead people. I'm like, oh. And we are not live. <laughs> I'm so sorry, guys. Uh, today, Wayne is not here. As you can see, the empty space here. He's on his honeymoon leave um, to the greatest city on earth, which is Perth, <laughs> according to some people. <laughs> no shit at Australians, but you know. <laughs> it's not the city I'm thinking of when yeah. someone says, this is the best city on earth. I've yeah. never heard anyone say that. Exactly. <laughs> So today we have a very special guest, which is Norman Chella. He is the world's first, okay, second. 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 Norman Chella is the world's second podcast librarian. He is also a writer of poetic fiction and is also currently writing a romantic memoir. Wow. Mm -hmm. And when he's not speaking behind the mic, he is writing. And when he's not, he's dancing in other mediums. Wow. A man of many, many talents. Thank you. Thank you. So did, did I get your like, you know, like a proper intro, right? Yeah, yeah, I would say, I would say that's correct. Um, I can't think of any other way to add a introduction to myself. Uh, I think, uh, you know, this is a taster for the kind of person that I am. I'd prefer that once someone gets to know me, mm. how I dance in other mediums, I will put that metaphorically. Then you'll see why is it that I introduce myself that way? Because even if I'm the current podcast librarian, I'm not limited to that medium. And that's a very important point to make. Yeah, so. I, well said because like, you know, I'm not just a podcaster, I'm also a filmmaker. Yeah. Wayne is also not just a podcaster, he's a writer. So yeah, uh, welcome on the show, Norman. Um, just for some context, right? Right now it's like the day before International Podcast Day. And we really are lucky to have Norm here, you know, all the way from Kuala Lumpur in Singapore, in studio, um, talking to us about ghost stories and stuff. Uh, we first met Norm at earlier this year at uh, Renegade Radio's uh, podcast event. So mm. thank you for inviting us and Hantu team, which you will see the vlog. Like, I think by then, by then you will have seen the vlog. So first thing first, how are you doing tonight? Well, <laughs> Firstly, I didn't eat lunch. Okay. And then here we are with two drinks on yes. my side here. Uh, so <laughs> I'm having the best time of my life at the moment. <laughs> because like, I don't, okay. The, the, I, I, only, I only drink socially. So it's very rare for me to, to, to actually be a little bit more liberal when it comes to like taking this in and then receiving mm. this. And also I always get excited for a recording. So I'm always very, very happy. But, Love that. you know, answering that question, it can't ever be better right now. Yeah. So I'm doing Amazing. You need, you need, uh, I think you, when you ask people how they're doing after like one or two beers in, I think usually they'll tell you, yeah, great. <laughs> no, no. I'm here to be my own hype man, okay? Yes. Right, so I'll, I'll help you up. I'll help you out. I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, Tiger Beer, yeah. So we mentioned podcast librarian, right? Broadly speaking, what is a podcast librarian? Yeah. <laughs> You know, I ask myself that question a lot. Um, this is a title that's only been passed around twice. So you've said it in my intro. Mm. I am the second podcast librarian. There has been only one other person mm. in the world. She's now retired oh. and she's moved to a different job. Oh. And essentially the title is to describe the person who is in charge of organizing, documenting, and crediting every podcast on the planet. If you think about a building like a library, Hmm. You have this person who's like behind the reception, behind the counter, probably an old man, I don't know who it is. Yeah. And they are in charge of organizing the books by genre, by author, by location, by category. We call this metadata, right? So yeah. metadata to organize um, a book depending on the contents, the title, whatever. Think of the digital equivalent. Think of the person who is in charge of making sure all the Wikipedia Wikipedia pages are searchable, are categorized, etc. Mm. This is the same thing. The podcast librarian in this case is the person in charge of all the data on a website that is very, very similar to IMDb. It's a website called Podchaser. Mm. If you have a podcast for anyone here listening, most likely your show is on Podchaser. 
and I'm in charge of making sure you look good. So, <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't look good, tell me so I can fix it for you. So yeah, um, I'm the person behind the counter. Uh, I'm the person that is essentially the janitor. I'm cleaning up stuff to make it very easy for a listener to Google something about your show, if you have a show, and hopefully finding you um, on their search results, the show, the episode in particular of your interest, mm. and maybe other similar results because mm. you're arriving at that bookshelf with that interesting show, mm. there might be other books that might catch your interest. So yeah, that's pretty much how I am. I, I think I was just doing some, <laughs> I was doing some librarian work today and uh, we have this thing called uh, moder uh, like feed moderation. Mm. We want to check whether or not we have many shows that are updates of a show or mm. they are completely separate shows. We have to like listen to them and make sure that we're okay. There was this new show that came out called Hear Us Out. Mm. There were 30 other shows called Hear Us Out on the website. Oh so God. we have to verify <laughs> if this is a different Hear Us Out or a, an updated version of a, an existing Hear Us Out on the website. So that's an example of uh, what we mean by making sure that, that a show is um, unique to stand up of his own or uh, easily found, et cetera. Oh so God. for anyone out there, uh, please make sure that you have a unique name or find a way to distinguish yourself in a way where it's very obvious for me to see that your show is a separate one. Because if I'm having trouble finding you, then nine times out of 10, a listener will have trouble finding you. This is like valuable advice right <laughs> there. Right? It's like straight from the podcast librarian. Yeah. And the fact that he's Southeast Asian, you know, Southeast Asian pride, right? But <laughs> Southeast Asian and a podcast like, okay, probably the, la the last podcast librarian for now, for now, right? In the world. So I think that is very important. And uh, I, do, I do agree that, you know, we need to catalog shows better because when you search shows that are not properly SEO, you know, like they, they, they yeah. never do research on their names, you get like 10 results. And I, I listen to podcasts on a daily basis. Sometimes I try to find a show that is, available on YouTube, but it's not on Spotify or they just don't care. Then you will see other shows with the same name, but not really the same content. So what they are doing is actually very, very admirable. Uh, and I think it's like, it's to look at numbers and, and you know, cataloging is, is something that I, I don't think I can <laughs> I'm able to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's noble work, but honestly, it's a lot of just staring at a screen yeah. and be like, it's basically what, what a librarian does, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you need to use the proper code and, and like the proper yeah, numbering yeah. system. I studied file numbering system. It's, it's, it's quite detailed. Yeah. It's very detailed. Yeah. We, we don't do a numbering system. We have an internal system, which is quite similar. And because we have to, we have to deal with that scale, right? Like 5 million. Think of a lot of people who have like, how do you, like imagine like, don't think about books or <laughs> podcasts or anything. Like imagine you have like five, 5 million things in the house. How do you organize all that? Exactly. Like, holy shit. Like, oh wait, like, sorry, can I swear on this yeah. show? Okay, okay. Holy fucking shit. Like yeah. how do you even handle that, right? I I have trouble with that myself. And then now we have this, this podcasting thing. And as much as I've built the muscle, it is still a challenge. It is mm. still a challenge to um, deal with the issue of disambiguation. So that's what we call it. Mm. Not only for shows, names, but who we call creator profiles. Ah. So people who contribute to a show. So mm. what if there's like three people named Brian Johnson? How do we know that they're a contributor to this specific show or somebody else or somebody else, right? So how do we distinguish between that? And that becomes a big challenge in itself. So yeah, yeah, many, many different um, issues, but it's actually quite fun doing so. Uh, what that means is that it's a lot of private solo work because you just have to do this silently. And that means I can listen to a lot of shows while I'm working. Which is like the best of both worlds, right? Yeah. So like, okay, let's have a, let's play a little game. All right. Okay, because right now the audio version of um, Dead Ad is actually hosted on Ghost Maps because we want to combine the listens, right? To get more listens. Ah, okay. Right? Master, make, show? Yeah, yeah, master Show? Yeah, Master Show? Yeah. So Ghost Maps is the master show and then we have uh, uh, Dead Air uh, as the secondary show, but we don't catalog them as an episode. So we don't give them episode name because it will be confusing for Ghost Maps listeners. So as a podcast librarian, how would you catalog Dead Air as a show? So we would recognize Dead Air as a sub show of the master show, which mm. is goes, uh, which is uh, the main name. Mm. Hierarchically, there is a primary show. There is a primary name. There is a primary uh, thing. The way that we look at it is very very similar. And if you can think of this analogy as a TV channel, mm. like HBO or something, right? right? HBO has different sections. 
And it's very clear what those sections are. HBO Max is like movies, HBO Blockbuster, whatever, you know, like yeah. you can think of these different names, right? That tells you instantly, oh, if I'm tuning in during this time, during this scheduling, I will receive this kind of experience. Mm. So what you're doing is actually perfectly fine. Mm. But how you're presenting it is probably something that I would pay more attention to. Mm. As an example, if you have um, Ghost Maps, which is the main primary show, and then Dead Air is maybe the conversational show or the interview show, etc., that's going to be a completely different format, a different intention, a different objective, mm. and you have to clarify to your, use, uh, your listeners that, oh, there is an episode out on this feed that you're subscribed to, mm. but do understand that this is a different experience. Mm. And remember, podcasting is a medium based on routines because a lot of people would listen passively yep. while they're walking the dog, washing the dishes, whatever, yeah. right? You need to tell them, hey, you're listening to Dead Air, which is a one hour, whatever, whatever conversation around A, B, C, D, E. Yeah. It's very different from the narrative essay, which is something else, right? Your main primary show. Mm. A good reference for this is Indian Noir, which is an amazing show that I keep referencing all the time because they do it really, really well. Mm. It's a master show with like five to six different stories. Oh my God. It's like amazing. So we have a primary show and then we have sub shows or sub segments. Are they set in the same universe? They're all, no. No. They're no, oh, no, nice. no, right? Interesting. And so they do horror and they do true crime and they do like fantasy as well. Ah. And the host, Nikesh, is a good friend of mine. I always talk to him about uh, many, many things around podcasting. Yeah. He just launched a book about horror actually. So oh. maybe something that you might want to look at. Oh, yeah, like, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, I, think, I think you guys will be friends if you talk to each other. Sure. Um, but I'll, I'll message after the show. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, master shows are quite common. Mm. It's very, very, um, I would say it's a very valid way of podcasting. Mm. It also introduces variety. Mm. You are filtering out listeners who love the variety. Mm. And you're also affirming to the listeners, especially for the ones on the show, that the listeners who stick out, even if the format changes, the listeners who stick out and can follow the hosts wherever they go, yeah are the best ones, the most receptive ones, the ones who are willing to listen into the inside jokes, the ones who are willing to <laughs> laugh with you when you say something fucking stupid. You know, like, like yeah. these kinds of people, right? Yeah. These are the people who resonate with you the most. And I talk about this a lot of time. A lot of the time where you have the most resonant audience, they follow you regardless of the medium, the attention span, the amount of time and energy invested in. And if your show happens to have a variety of episodes and shows, yeah, go for it. I would say, if I were to catalog it as a librarian, I will consider Dead Air a secondary show because the primary show is Ghost Maps. Because when someone subscribes to the show or searches for the show, they will not search for Dead Air, they'll nope. search for Ghost Maps. Yep. Right, so that's how you go. Awesome, yeah, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm very grateful that, I mean the numbers so far is that Ghost Maps listeners are quite receptive to Dead Air. Nice. Not all, I would say like a 70%, which is pretty good. Which that's is, which is good. pretty good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not that it's not that bad. Yeah. So okay. And also fan service, right? I know that you guys won ghost stories like instantly, but remember it's still a talk show, so we're we're easing into it. The next question. <laughs> because Norm, he he has he is part of uh, the Iban people. He has Iban heritage and culture. So Norm, can you share with us how like your Iban heritage and culture has influenced your relationship with supernatural? with the supernatural, like, ooh. Oh God, okay. <laughs> prepare for, prepare for let's, three hours of, of, let's of, go. of lecturing. Okay, all right, all right. I need a, I need a, I need a fuel up for this. Let's set the context first, because sure. I think some people who might not be aware oh, yeah. of the Dayak peoples of Borneo might not be yeah, aware of, of the Iban people. So, um, I'm Malaysian. I come from East Malaysia, from Sarawak, the state. We are part of, uh, if, you're, if you find it in the database, we're called Other, uh, but we are part of the Dayak peoples. And essentially we are the indigenous peoples who have lived on the islands for a very long time. Um, from Borneo, and I am part of the Iban tribe. And these are the sea Dayaks. We have long houses that are near the rivers. We are famous for head hunting. Yep. We are famous for being the most warlike. Uh, we have famous for having big black and bold tattoos. We are famous for basically doing guerrilla tactics, going on wars, loving blood, loving violence, etc. until headhunting became banned. Yeah. 
Ibans are most famous for headhunting, and yep. this is a very, very notable thing. It's part of our history, and there are connotations to it. So growing up, I never really understood that because I was too young to understand. We would always go back once a year, twice a year to our longhouse, which is like five hours away from Kuching in Sarawak. Mm. Five-hour drive into the forest, and then wow. suddenly there's like a longhouse, this elevated wooden platform house with like 26 doors, a door for each family, mm. and we are right in the middle uh, because we are affiliated with the chief of the longhouse at the time, mm. uh, who is my grandfather, um, and we have this tendency to live in a very different pace when we're at the longhouse to just enjoy mm. the life of the forest, being in the forest. Mm farming, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what I didn't know was that, and this is a true story, I think I was five or six, and I was walking down the longhouse um, common room, I think the communal room. Essentially what how it works is that each door represents a family living there, mm. but then there's a communal community room which is the length of the longhouse right in front and mm. people can hang around there and it's like a public playing area talking area discussion area and if there's a chance where all the community comes together to have a big grand dinner everyone's eating there together so, so it, it's still part of this wooden structure it is part of the wooden structure oh, right okay. so you have this part here i remember walking down there because it's a long long house and i look up and i'm like oh mom what's that because <laughs> i see this chandelier i'm like oh mom what's that and she's like oh um, those are skulls. And I'm like, oh, what's a skull? And it's like, oh, it's the heads of dead people. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I got introduced to death at a very young age because it's not just death, it is death with intent, mm. right? So let's talk about that because obviously it's gonna be a very interesting part of the supernatural element. Mm. In the Ivan tribe, headhunting was quite prevalent. Mm. There are a few rules to headhunting, which I should preface now. Mm. One is that headhunting must be witnessed. So you have warriors from a longhouse, they're going to raid another village, another longhouse, whatever. Mm. They come in and they raid and a warrior challenges another warrior to a duel. There must be a third person, a third party to recognize the duel. Anyone? Um, most of the time it's from their own longhouse, mm. right? Because they need to be the one to tell the tale. Ah, okay. Right? Um, and I'll explain why in a bit, right? So this person is basically, I don't want to say a referee, but it's the closest thing. Mm. Who's like, bear witness to this thing that's about to happen. They have a fight and then someone wins. When that person wins, he decapitates the head Jeez. and preserves it in a specific container or chamber that's built for keeping skull. Mm. And they bring it back. And it's built in a certain way. I can't really describe it because even I get a bit confused as to why it has to be preserved in a certain way because there's a spiritual element to it. Mm. But that head gets brought back, the skull gets preserved, and then it gets hung. Now, the reason why we do that is because when a warrior kills another warrior, that dead person's blood is on their hands, mm. both on their weapon and on their hands. And when they come back to their family, back to their longhouse after a long day's work raiding other villages and killing whatever, <laughs> right? Um, the person, the dead person, can smell their own blood. Mm. So their vengeful spirit may come back to the scent of their own blood to haunt the family. Mm. So they hung the dead person's skull in front to scare the spirit with their own Hate. image of death. Oh, damn. It is a ward to prevent the ghost from being, from scaring the family by scaring him with his own head. With his own head. Jeez. Right? So we're like, we, we're basically, we're counter, it's like a counter against ghosts yeah. by scaring the ghost with their own death. Oh. Because from, from our perspective, because um, um, even history has, has this concept of mana, has this concept of history and lore. Mm. And mm. I mean, there's, you can always, you can ask these questions, of course, but there are different kinds of, there are different kinds of spirits and creatures um, yeah, yeah. within even history. In the realm of ventral spirits, ventral spirits are essentially based on or fueled on negative emotion, on anger, on rage, on mm. dishonor, on death. Like these are intangible concepts that uh. that give birth to this person that died, right? Mm. They are then weak to a tangible representation of their own skull. Because it's like telling you like, 
oh, you come in because you want to scare the person that killed you. But then it's like, look at your fucking body. I fucking headshot at you. And you know, like, like you come in and then you see your skull and then you get, and then you get protected. So mm. what this means is one, the warrior is doing so to protect their family from any form of possession, any form of uh, spiritual entanglement. And two, it is a sign of strength because mm. Mm. in the Iban tribe ages ago, like we're talking about centuries ago, the number of skulls relate to your status within a longhouse. Oh. Your sign of strength is, it's like saying like, you're really rich if you have a mansion, this is the equivalent. It's like, if you have five skulls, yeah, you're yeah. like, you're like, you're like Jeff Bezos. Like, like, it's like that. Dude, level. like if you, you have like hundred skulls means you decapitate the hundred, hundred men. You I can't think of a family that even has a hundred. Like, like a hundred, like, like okay, 30 yeah. or 40 is like, damn. Like, like 10, like, 10 yeah. is impressive. 10 is pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah, it's like you I, kill 10 men. I, 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 have the, I have the ranking, I have the tier for you, okay? Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. You have raid teams, right? So yeah. these are teams that would raid other villages. Yeah. Okay. But these are also like uh, fellow Iban people. Yeah, oh, okay. Iban people, same Iban people in the long house. Okay. okay? If you have um, three skulls, mm. you have the right to lead a squad of warriors. Okay. Wow. If you have five skulls, you have the right to propose a raid to another long house. Wow. Okay. And then if you have seven, you're like basically the commander or the general of the army so you like, that long house there's like a ranking like, military system like almost. a sergeant yeah yeah a, a lieutenant and then like a general yeah yeah then what's the next level like? uh, i i can't really i i, I don't really know mm. um what but I, do you know like if there's more than 10 like yeah yeah recorded yeah, yeah. historical oh. yeah, yeah so so um uh my long house in particular mm. is based off of an ancestor from a different prefecture. Mm. We, we call it prefectures, but like different areas, yeah, yeah. different regions uh, within Sarawak. Mm. And uh, we always, I, I don't know why I keep referencing this, but this is quite true. Mm. Um, so if you know Henry Golding, the actor, yes. he is also Iban. Half, right? Half Iban, yeah, yeah half Iban. And I believe he is also from the Betong prefecture, mm. which is the prefecture or the region that my ancestor is from. Mm. So Batong is the most powerful region mm. in Sarawak mm. in terms of like um, uh, Iban history. Yeah. My ancestor in particular has had maybe 40, 50 heads from the same ancestor. Like as in like this one guy? I believe so, yes. Oh, okay. damn. So what he did, right? Like I said, it's a status symbol, mm. right? And part of this is that it's a status symbol, so he he had the largest family as a result. Mm. His family became too large to stay in the same longhouse. Mm. So he actually ordered a percentage of his family members to emigrate and then move to a different prefecture. And then that prefecture ended up becoming, sorry, that longhouse, as a result, that decision became our longhouse. So mm. that's how we became related. Oh. Part of that to recognize the status of this new longhouse that's being built is that we carried some of the skulls that he had hunted mm. to showcase that we are also strong. Mm. Even though we're like a secondary family of the, you know, whatever. Oh. So we have eight or nine under oh. our longhouse. So there are eight or nine you skulls. Have, you've seen it. Yeah, it's still there. It's, yeah. it's still there? Yeah, I mean, I see it. Yeah, every, every time I go back- Is, it, is it illegal to keep it? No, no, it's, it's just kept there. Or because it's it's cultural, it's cultural it's preservation. Historical. Yeah, cultural preservation. It's not like recent, like no, no, no. It's, not recent. <laughs> it's like a, <laughs> it's, it's like a couple hundred years old, like yes, hundred. Yes. Okay, okay, uh, the hundred, two hundred. Oh, yeah, hundred, two hundred. That, that's that's quite, well, they, quite recent, and they're quite still quite in pristine condition. It's still skull. It's very obvious that it's a skull. Oh, jeez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I would say it's smaller in size because of preservation, but yeah, oh. it, it is quite obvious. I mean, I can, I'll show you. A, I'll show you a picture after the, Whoa, or if you want to put it on the video or sure, whatever. Sure, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll show you. I can send you a yeah. picture of the, the thing. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, uh, it's still up there. It's front of my in front of my mm. door, not in my actual house, but in the long house. Yeah. Oh. Um, but is there anyone who stays there in the long house? I mean, yeah, yeah. My is that your relatives. Yeah, my aunt, my grandmother, oh, nice. etc. Yeah, and my extended family because mm. because uh, a lot of these long houses are related in some way. Um, because as soon as you find out that somebody else is Iban there's probably a way for us to connect ancestors, uh, right? So, yeah. yeah. Um, Interesting. 
Yeah, so you have these uh, long houses that are built on in in more peaceful regions, mm. but they come as derivatives of these most powerful, active, warlike. But the the most powerful areas. one is still active. I mean, the, the, <laughs> not okay. Wait, wait, not wait, okay. Wait, wait, wait. Let, let me set the context. Not active, <laughs> as in like hate hunting are uh, active, but I mean like they're still uh, descendants. So like they, they are all uh, so still it, around. So nowadays it's translated to wealth and riches. Okay. Right. So yeah, this, sure. the definition of status symbol within Iban is now like, you know, like money, mm. et cetera. Right. Because we, we've now banned the practice of head hunting. Yeah. Allegedly. So like we have that, right. Um, so Betong, if you, if you ask someone, mm. okay, this is an Iban person from Betong, mm. they're most likely very, very powerful, very, very rich or very well connected. Right. Mm. But then for my prefecture, which is Saribas, we're not that far off. Like we, we can be, you know, we, Compared to them, we're not as strong, but we're, we're okay. Mm. So yeah, um, from memory, the ancestor had 38 buried in front of their longhouse. So what that means is that if we had eight or nine, we had like 40, he, this person, had, this ancestor had 40 plus, but we don't know if they've emigrated elsewhere. Mm. So we don't know if they had 50, 60, 70, 80, plus heads mm. from the same family or the same ancestor. Yeah. But what that meant is that they had such a powerful longhouse that they have to basically emigrate it or force all their family, mem family members elsewhere. Mm. And then they still had so many skulls and then they're like, okay, this is, this is too much. We need to put these skulls to rest and then we bury them. So mm. like there's like 30 plus skulls buried now. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much how it is. Uh, doesn't it feel weird like going back I mean every year going back to like your long house and then you say oh it's a, it's a skull number one doesn't it feel <laughs> creepy like it's skull number two do you guys know the backstory of the guy's head um we don't okay but there are rules that would filter out the kinds of people that would be headhunted oh okay right so one is that the head the headhunt does not count if it's non dayak oh. or non Malaysian or non Malay, right? Oh, so really, we do not have, you know, British skulls or Japanese skulls, you know, Chinese? because no, uh, no. So it has to be like native as per se. Native. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Like Bumi, Bumi Putra, I guess is the, the correct word. Okay. Yeah. yeah fair there's, there's a, there's a reason why. Um, okay. It is because if um, we believe that these other races do not know the way of combat in the forest. So if you are a warrior that is willing to headhunt these, uh, these kinds of people, mm. then it is cowardly. Ah, okay. okay. Right? So it is a it's disrespect. Not honor, not honorable. It's not honorable. Because yeah. they don't know how to fight the same way yeah, as Yeah, exactly. You. Okay, so okay, yeah, okay. so we have these like, you know, you know like you know, when British occupied, etc. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. there's going to be some rebellion, etc. But then they come in and then they would, they would headhunt these people and then these skulls would get rejected. Ah. Also, you have... Because that, that that's why the ref the referee is that <laughs> right right yeah. this is not and an honorable like, no head. It doesn't count. <laughs> right? yeah I don't know if that kind of conversation ever happened but but what we do know is that 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 rule does apply so yeah if yeah uh, foreign heads are not accepted ah okay. and and even during that and remember this is during like Malaya times yeah, yeah, right yeah. yeah so this is before yeah uh, the 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 gathering of different states, etc. So we can't really address that history because Iban history is a lot longer than that. I'm sure. Yeah. So yeah, when it comes to uh, when it comes to combat, it's most likely between other villages, other warriors, yeah. where who you recognize as warriors, we can pit ourselves against. Yeah. Then you earn the right to to defeat and yeah. claim the head. I so. mean, throughout my like brief research on like the Iban people and the Sea Dayaks, right? I remember like reading about like. Um, the colonizers actually using different tribes against each other. Yes. And then they commit like basically hay hunting against each other. Yep. Which is already common, right? Because they need to like basically pillage another village. And basically the colonizer came in, oh, I'll pay you to go and kill this bunch of people. So so that would, that would be an honorable kill, right? Because it's yeah. the same people. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, you would you would do that, and and when the British administration came, it, it was very and then valid. they banned it. Yeah, and then they banned it, and, and <laughs> this was because um, initially this was an unknown land and unknown culture for the British. Right, they come in and they're from outside the box. They, they come in yeah, and they're like, okay, we need to learn the lay of the land. We need to learn how the people communicate with each other, mm. and supposedly it's 
through this very violent form, mm. which is very foreign, <laughs> unreligious, <laughs> right? So yeah, when you have these, to them, yeah. yeah. So when these missionaries came in and then they introduced Christianity, because that was that was what our 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 culture was based on, on yeah, yeah, animism, yeah, of course, right? Of course, yeah. So our relationship with animals and the forest and and spirits, like you know, the word orangutan yeah. is people of the forest, yeah. because for Dayaks, we believe that. Monkeys, primates, and very similar species represented individuals who have passed on their ancestors lived in the spirits of these animals, mm. right? So we don't know if it's true or would not. Would you say that it's shamanistic in a sense? Yeah. Well? yeah, I would say yes. Yeah, mm. because there are other tribes that are not Iban that uh. are definitely more shamanistic in terms of tendencies uh. and you know stuff like voodoo and black magic, etc. Mm. So currently, there's like what twenty something tribes in Sarawak. But they are from, they are also the diet people. It's just that different tribes. They are from diet people, but they are just different, different tribes. Different tribes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And even then there are some people who are like less willing to communicate with other people who are from different tribes because they just hold very different principles and values. Mm. And so, I'm sure. you know, yeah. So we have that. And that's what leads to a very strange spiritual relationship because I grew up looking at these skulls and be like, ah, oh, okay, this was a person. Yeah. Right. This thing I see in front of me, I grew up and I'm like, oh, you know, like, Jeez. you know, toys when I was young and then cartoons on TV and then dead people on the sigling. Yeah, it's like. And it became, <laughs> yeah, and then it became normalized. But then what it meant was that I became a lot more sensitive to everything spiritual mm. because, because these conversations were normalized in my day-to-day -day upbringing. Mm. So when we go back, suddenly it's like, oh, you know, you're in the city for a long time. And after that, for this one day, during harvest festival in June, you go back to the longhouse and you're like, oh, we're near, we're near the skulls. Okay, don't, don't, don't insult them. You know, like don't, don't anger the spirits. But so the spirits are still in the skulls or around the skulls? We, I can't say because mm. I haven't been possessed or anything. Okay. Like, so I can't really say. But what I can say is when we think about spiritual presence, mm. It is not in the evidence of what was violent years ago. Mm. It is the actions of the present time. So rules to prevent you from doing X in the forest. So we have some rules depending on the family and depending on the longhouse. Like the forest around the longhouse. The forest along the okay. longhouse. Like for example, if you have a, 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 a monkey or or a nurangtan, mm. um, or a primate, uh, or an ape, mm. um, you're not allowed to disturb or interrupt whatever they do. Even if they're doing something as crazy as ruining your farm, oh. and you cannot trap them, etc. Yeah. And that is because they have a huge connotation with spirits or the, the spirits of ancestors from a long time ago. So we had a story where <clears throat> there was an, a distant uncle of us who lives in the same longhouse. There was a monkey that was ruining his farm. He was like trying to make money, mm -hmm. ruining his farm. He was like, oh, fuck. And mm -hmm. he built a cage, trapped the monkey. He left the monkey overnight. He went to sleep. And then in his sleep, he had a dream where he had visions of his ancestors coming in and be like, dude, you're not allowed to do that. Like, or else like we'll haunt you or something like that. And he's like, oh, fuck. And then he woke up and then he let out the monkey. And then after that, he had to lead, let the monkey do whatever. And then he'll eventually get bored and leave. And then the vision stopped. So that's an example of what is very, essentially a very animist way mm -hmm. of looking at life around the forest, right? Because so, so how we view spiritual connection is that it is so attuned to our way of life. Mm. And for Ibans at that time, our way of life is very simple, mm. right? You stay around the longhouse, you hunt, you get food, you farm. And then if you're a man and you want to be a warrior, you go and help out the team. That's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. So all of that leftover energy is spent towards something what is essentially creative, which is these visions that are so vivid, so surreal, and they further push the bias of like, oh, do these monkeys actually represent the spirits of our forest? So you suddenly have these things and they, they start being, being solidifying and then that becomes the, the full on culture of it. So speaking of um, experiences, do you have any Experiences that you can share with us? Like supernatural experience. It doesn't have to be Iban. It can be anything. It can be like your, your time in university or something. I don't know. Like I mentioned, 
this led to very led to a very sensitive upbringing. Mm. So when it came to anything that concerns spiritual connection, mm. maybe even if I encounter it, I'll still be skeptical, but I won't deny it. Mm. Right. So there was a time when I was maybe seven or eight. We were in Miri in Sarawak. And we hadn't gone back to the longhouse in a while. I was seven or eight. I was sleeping and then I woke up middle of the night to see that there's a window next to my bed. And I looked out the window because I heard a noise and it was my dog, my pet dog, ran out to the field and then ran into a shed, a small wooden shed, and then just disappeared. And I was like, oh no, mm-hmm. I'm worried because my dog, right? So I'm like, okay, I need to be the one to save him. Mm. And no one else was waking up. So I was like, okay, sure. Let me just save him. I got out of the house, went to the field, went to this wooden shed. I remember thinking very specifically, I've never seen this wooden shed before. But my dog went into it. I'm like, okay, okay. I don't care about it. I need to save my ship, my my dog. I went in. And as soon as I went in, it is a small shed from outside. Okay. It is the equivalent of like, um, maybe two or three of like the public toilets if you go to a concert. Oh, okay. okay? Very, very small, right? But there's a door made of wood and okay. go in. I go in, but then when I went in, there's a big house underneath. Whoa. There's two floors. And I remember I walked in I'm like, why is this house or shed really big? All completely made of wood. There are two things I remember. One is everything is made out of wood. So like the wood of this table, Mm. floor, ceiling, wall, same thing. Mm. The second one is there is a space next to me on my left with what is seen to be a sprout or a branch. It's like a plant. Mm. And it was growing in the middle of growing. It's like a very young plant. I guess it was just planted there very recently. It was just there on my left. Mm. I'm like, okay, this is a strange location. And I looked around. I'm like, where's my dog? That's my first thing that I looked around. I heard a noise from upstairs because there's the stairs that go up. The dog was not on the ground floor. I did not see any movement or hear any signs or whatever. Mm. So I went up to the stairs and every step was a creek mm. until the fourth creek was a lot larger and you hear like a like a descending of the sound of the creek on the step behind you no on the step that I did on the fourth step mm. and I looked up and there's this second floor so what I'm seeing in front of me is another floor, there's a door, and there's a corridor going horizontally to showcase the rest of the floor. And there's a figure in white, wearing a robe in white, and wearing a mask, which is just white cloth over. Jeez. No sign, no character, no writing, whatever, pure white. And this individual was holding a cane and it's floating across, you don't hear the step, you hear the cane. So it's just. Mm. And suddenly it, this cloth, this, this figure, I could see the eyes on the side profile of the mask. And without moving the rest of its body, the eye turned to look at me. Jeez. And I remember feeling the greatest chill on my back ever at like nine years old or whatever. Mm. And I ran out. I ran down the stairs. I screamed. But here's the crazy part was this, whatever this was noticed me. I screamed and I ran out. But right before I ran out, I was about to open the door to shed. Right before I ran out, that sprout from the very beginning became a full tree. Mm. This tree blew off the roof. So there was moonlight coming in. Jeez. So it was a dark first floor, a dark ground floor. I saw this, I ran out, and then it was just tree 
But there was no destruction of the roof. There was nothing. It was just a tree. I ran out. I ran out of the shed. I looked behind me. The shed was a normal size, just like before. I found my dog. My dog was there as well. <laughs> I went to hug the dog because I was like so scared. And I was so scared I pissed myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> because of course you do that at nine years old. Yeah, sure. And then I went back to my uh, home and brought the dog back. And then I went to sleep. And my, first, my last thought before I slept was that maybe this was all a dream because it could have been a nightmare, crazy, fucking whatever, right? Yep. And then I woke up and my pajama pants had mud. Oh, damn. So it was like, I, I can't deny it, right? I can't like, you know, I'm trying my best to like, you know, deny the whole experience, but I'm like, it's like mud, it smells like mud, whatever. The pee is still there. <laughs> I mean, it smelled like shit. I'm pretty sure I like smell the pee. Yeah. yeah, it's wet. I mean, like I tried to dry myself after. Wait, you you managed to go back to sleep. That's the amazing part. I don't remember how long it took for me to get back to sleep, mm. but I eventually did. And then I woke up, and then I'm like, oh my god, jeez. Yeah. So this is when you were nine. So this is nine. was it, was it at a long house? No, no, no. It's at my normal house. So it's like a normal like yeah. a city house. Okay, yeah. so it was like one of those like normal like two story houses and. Yeah, exactly. That, but you had a yard, right? Um, Big enough for you to have a shed. Right? Um, so, so this was so this was in a neighborhood area, mm. but there was an area of uh, undeveloped land mm. around your house near nearby. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was just like it was forest. Twenty second, yeah. It's just like like meadow, mm. green grass land. But yeah. the shed was a real thing, or was it like? No, it wasn't there anymore. So you didn't have the a shed. shed. There was no shed after. Oh shit! Like the morning after. Jeez. Right? Yeah. The morning after, I was yeah. like, okay, I need to check. So there's no shed. No, no shed. No, it was just green grass. But you had, you never had a shed at your place. Not at my place. No, no. This, it, this wasn't our shed. Oh. And this wasn't our yard. But it was. It was undeveloped land. I could see the undeveloped land from my window. Oh, f- right. Yeah. So we had a block with like houses and neighbors and whatever. And then this is area that my window was facing. Mm. And just undeveloped land, mm. and there was a shed. Mm. And then in the morning, there's no shed. You had you had your own room, room, right? Yes. Jeez. So did you tell did you tell anyone about it? No. <laughs> Not even your 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 parents. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I got scolded because they're like, "What do you have mud in your pants?" <laughs> <laughs> no, like your legs would have mud as well. I'm uh, pretty sure. I, I guess so. Yeah. I mean, I I washed my feet after, but then it's like my pants. You know, my pants had like some like leftover mud on the- But but what's your, like, I mean, what's your rationale after so many years? Like what's, okay, what's, what's your yeah, yeah. thought about that experience? Yeah. So my, what I'm worried about is that there's a certain bias because I had a lack of understanding as a child. Mm. My crazy theory is that I'm not sure if there was a shed but I may have been sleepwalking mm. that I did go to the field yeah, and it would blind me to combine my experience of being actually on the field versus something that's potentially delusional, which is a dream, whatever, whatever. Mm. Right. You never know, but if, if maybe what I thought was four steps up some stairs is actually just like a hill yeah. made of mud. It yeah. could be. I don't could know. Be, yeah. Right. I don't know. And then the tree that I saw was just maybe like an illusion or a mirage or something like that. Mm. Because outside of that, I've had hallucinations where I've seen something that I thought was real, and but then it wasn't. yeah, yeah and, and then it turns out it wasn't right. So there's that, you know. So that was probably the most prominent one. I mean, there are some others where like because because I used to live in Tokyo as well. So part of that was sometimes there are some temples where I feel very uncomfortable about walking in. Mm. There'll be like specific times where I'll be like, oh. It's three four p.m. and then they ring the bell and then when ring the bell, I have a chill down my spine. I'm like. I don't want to go inside. And my, my friends who are like, you know, very touristy, they're like, oh, we will go inside and take pictures or whatever. I'm like, oh, I'll just wait outside. It'll be fine, you know? Yeah, I mean, speaking of like Tokyo and Japan, right? Yeah. We recently, earlier this year, we had like another guest uh, who is who was based in Japan, Jay Nightmares. He's like a horror YouTuber. So he also tells ghost stories uh, on YouTube. Uh, Japanese ghost stories to be exact. I remember my only creepy experience in Japan 
was uh, in Okinawa. When mm. I tell people that, especially Japanese people or people who have been into Japan, they were like, they always give me this, yeah, Okinawa. Yep, Okinawa. And I didn't, yep. I didn't realize how creepy that was. Like, like I was on a shoot. Uh, uh, I was with a client to shoot a documentary in Okinawa, and it was an innocent enough shoot. Like we wanted to basically document like the sanitarians, sanitarians, sanitarians uh, that are living in. Uh, this elderly village called Ogimi in Okinawa. So like people who live past 95, 99, they are still super active. Yeah. So, and it's very deep inside Okinawa, like an hour deep uh, from the main part of Okinawa. Yeah. And I remember us going up a, a mountain, driving up a mountain to shoot some time lapse. And then it was pitch black. And at this point, it's 2018, I haven't started Ghost Maps. I only started Ghost Maps in 2019. So the horror aspect didn't really kick in for some reason. And it was raining heavily. And I remember in the mountains, I went to a toilet, which was pitch black. I had to use my flashlight to go to the toilet. And the horror aspect was just not there. It was like, oh, it's a very cool new country. I didn't even remember like the Americans basically attacked Okinawa first, you know. Uh, as part of their retaliation in the World War in World War Two, so I that didn't register. Like I didn't register. Like oh, Okinawa was part of the World War. It had like suffered this tr- tragedy and stuff. Nothing. So I was peeing, and then when we were going down the mountain pass, uh, and uh, uh, due to a lack of judgment, we decided to take an abandoned road. <laughs> abandoned road <laughs> on a mountain pass in. Okinawa. You're Japan. taking all the bad decisions a side character would make in a horror movie. Exactly. right Exactly. Like then we, we took that route and then <laughs> the car got stuck. It was a, it, it was like one of those like Honda or Odysseys or something. It got stuck uh in a ditch. So it had like one of those big um uh long kangs. Then the, the, the wheel was it. And me being the stupid 25 year old I was back then, came out of the car. Heavy rain, ah. Uh. Middle of the forest, this abandoned road is like forested. Tried to pull the car out of the dish. I was like, this is so dumb. I'm like, why did I do that? And then I tried to pull the car and then the client was trying to rev the car out and we were stuck. And I I didn't get the creepy vibes at all. And then I basically we caught like their, their version of AAA and they, they tried to get us out, uh, but they couldn't, their car got stuck as well because it's nice. the country. Then they had to call someone from the city to get us out. And then they're like, oh yeah, you guys are very lucky because if you take another turn, you would have went to a road that is probably off the cliff and you would have died or your even worse, you have stuck. Cause when you know your car is off the, like dangling off the cliff, right? Like you, you your car is like barely moving. So you can't move. Holy shit. Yeah. It's our final destination shit right yeah. now. Oh my and, God. And, and the, the set, the, the creepy part is that the mountain, the abandoned road in the mountain pass, right? This way, if our car flipped this way, so it was towards the hill, this side. So it's this hill. But if we flip this way, the car would have went down the hill. And that would have been damaging. It's, it's not, I mean, it's not a cliff, but it's like still a hill. Uh, we could have got seriously injured. And for some reason we didn't. And a part of me, you know, always think back to that night and thinking like, wow, there were probably a whole bunch of spirits they were like, you know, you stupid guy, Jin, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, not like how like, you know, like the, the, yeah, the spirits back then, they're like, yeah, there's like this stupid tourists coming to this place and this haunted, obviously very, very haunted forest at night and thinking that nothing would have gone. And then when I started the whole ghost maps research, I read up a lot about Okinawa. It's like, oh damn, I could have died. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the worst part. I tell you what's the worst part. The worst part was that the client, because the client was, you know, was the one that rented everything, the client had to stay back with the AAA guys yep. to, to, you know, to basically uh, get the car out because it's expensive, right? And then I went back, they got another car to send me back to an Airbnb. Like we had an Airbnb, a very nice mountain uh, cabin. We had two mountain cabins side by side, but it's on top of the mountain, another mountain, about 20 minutes drive, and I was alone. <laughs> All right. In that mountain, in that on the top, top of the mountain, alone in that mountain cabin by myself because my client was in another side trying to get the car. I was alone. I got so scared. I was like, 
shit, it's 3 a.m. right now and it's raining heavily and I'm on this mountain alone. The, the Airbnb hills, they don't even stay there. They stay at the bottom of the mountain. So nobody is here to help me. I barely have any signal. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to on like Japanese talk shows and I'll try to sleep. Guess what? I didn't sleep last, that night. Lah. But it was like, it was one of the best experiences I had, but also the worst. I will have you know, okay. Heavy rain, alone by yourself on a mountain, away from help. 3 a.m. is like the ideal script for any horror movie. Yeah. And, and the weird thing is that the mountain cabin, I mean, the mountain cabin is facing the cliff. So you, when you go out and then there's like this outdoor area and there's like railings, right? You can see the cliff. You can just jump and then you will just fall to your death with the forest. Lah. So, oh, so is, is that that out of nature? And then it has like super tall ceilings, like a three story cabin, but you know, like the bed is in the middle and you can see up. So it's all endless. So it's all like like a and like a big like ceiling. So I keep thinking in my mind, oh my god! Anytime now, Juan's gonna pop out like <laughs> just look at me and meow. I'm like shit. It's okay. Juan doesn't Juan doesn't inhabit the the prefectures that are closer to. <laughs> if you can think about it, right? If you think about it, right? Okay. Okinawa is like the Southeast Asia of Japan, right? Yeah. Because it's close to the equator, right? So. You're, you're used to it, right? Singapore is near the equator. It's fine. Yeah. It, it, it no, the okay. food the food's different. The food is different. The food is different. They have they have pre spicy chili. I gotta give like some some kind of green chili. And I went to read up like uh the Okinawans before being annexed by Japan. They they were their own country and their own yeah. kingdom. They traded with Malaysia. No, not Malaysia, Malaya. Yeah. They the traded Ryu, quite heavily. Yeah. The Ryukyu Malaysia. kingdom was actually very, very prominent. Yeah, at, at that point of time. Yeah. And then the I remember the host telling me, like, oh, yeah, uh, by the way, we have a lot of poisonous snakes here. Yeah. They have a specific poisonous snake. One bite, 20 minutes, you're dead. And I was like, wait, I was in the forest with a whole bunch of snakes that I didn't know about walking around. I was like, shit. The question there is, do you want to be more scared of ghosts or snakes? And my, my immediate answer is snakes because snakes, we- Snakes, bro. Yeah, yeah. Snakes, bro. Yeah. Anytime, snakes. Yeah. So we, we have an, in Iban culture, we actually have like family specific rules. Mm. So in my family, we're not allowed to eat python. Mm. And I don't know why, right? So one is we're not allowed to eat crocodile. And the other one is we're not, we're not allowed to eat python. It's a family thing. The, the crocodile one is a cultural thing. And then the python one is a family okay. thing. That's a nice tangent. So yeah. why? Yeah, so crocodile is because crocodiles can smell their own scent. And so sea um, Dayaks or Iban tribes, not only just Iban, but also other tribe members as well. Mm. A lot of their transport was through boat and down the river. Mm. And these are through crocodile infested rivers. Jeez. So you want to limit the amount of ways in which a crocodile can detect you or sense you. Because if you eat them, they can smell it. They can smell their own kind. Oh, right? shit. So um, my, my dad would tell me these stories where he, and even until now, you know, he's like, you know, like retired, etc. He has a very keen sense of smell. Mm. When he would go back from school to the longhouse mm. with his father, my grandfather. Yep. My grandfather was a teacher in the same school. So right. they both would go, to, go back together. They'll take a boat to go down the river to go back to the longhouse. And he would sit in the front of the boat and my grandfather would be rowing the boat on the back. And all my father had to do was to stare down the river and put his hand up. And if he puts his hand up, it means he can smell the scent of crocodile. Mm. And if he smells the scent of crocodile, immediately go to the bank, wait for a while on the side, and then go back on the river and quickly go back down again. So sometimes some trips will take hours just to go back to the longhouse from the- From the- School. From school, yeah. Jeez. So we have these fears that are dependent on- Survival. Yeah, survival, you know, animals in the forest, etc. Mm. But when it comes to spiritual things, it's more of it's more of the spiritual elements that dictate our behaviors on a day to day routine, mm. as opposed to fears that dictate our immediate life or death situation actions. Mm. Right? Oh. Yeah. Okay. So, like, let me set the context. Right? Yeah. yeah sure. Like <clears throat> Malay Malay folklore, we have the Pontiana. Yeah. Chinese folklore. I don't know, we have Jiangsi, Hungry Ghost Month, right? Yes. Uh, uh, so what is 
Iban folklore, the entity, the quintessential entity that you know all um, Iban people know, or all, all diet people know. So, hmm. I might have to show my tats for this. So this is <laughs> this is more important. Yeah, uh, for <laughs> for the ones who are listening to the audio version of this, you probably want to look at the video version for this specific section. So, um, to preface, yeah. Um, in Ivan folklore, mm. we do have a lot of history when it comes to mm. one writing lore or stories about the spirits that encompass us, mm. but two using that to our advantage. Oh, okay. And as a reminder, Ivan is a very warlike tribe during mm. its prime. Mm. So, what we do is that we have a lot of tattoos inked onto us where we want to main objective. Mm. Instill fear into the opponent. Yeah. Big, black, bold tattoos. Yeah. See from a far distance. Oh shit, this is a warrior that's going to murder me and take my head. That's, that's the objective. Like, it's pretty simple, right? Yeah. One of the ways is that we use lore against them. So, um, yeah, I think we can put see. This, yeah. Oh, geez. Yeah. That's nice. That's a nice ink. So, this is part of uh, my family shield. Um, we have two shields in the longhouse and a shield is essentially a crest. Like a family emblem. Like a family emblem and oh, crest. Really yeah. Cool. So yeah. instead of a logo or a brand or a design or et cetera, this is etched into our shields, which the warriors wield into battle. Mm. So this is the exact shield design that is onto our shield that our family represents when we when our previous ancestors are warriors go into to war. Mm. And we have two shields because two warrior families married to continue our bloodline, right? Mm. So this is from our initial, my, 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 my father's side, I believe. So, mm. yeah. Mm. On one of them, I don't know if you can zoom in on here, but I'll just, I'll just put it here. Just yeah, yeah, easier. You can, yeah, yeah, you can yeah. see it, yeah. So sure. on one of them, there is one face here. Okay, we call it Hantu Grassi. Mm. And Grassi, um, or oh, hantu, I mean, you know the hantu word hantu. Of course, of course, of course, it goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course, of course. In this context, it's a little bit different um, because we have different kinds of spirits. Okay. Because you have ghosts, you have spirits, but then you have giants. Okay. And giants are what we call mythical creatures that exist in the forest that are larger than the forest. Mm. The equivalent I can think of because I was trying to research this because uh, a lot of this is orally given. Like it's just, it's not like a thing that you can search on Wikipedia. It's you not well like, documented. Like. Yeah, it's not well documented, right? Because we don't really have a strong um, written historian that's there to like talk about these things. So I would hear a lot of this, a lot about this from my dad and from my, my tattoo artist as well. Mm. He said that uh, giants are creatures that are of various affiliations, mm. good, evil, neutral. Kind of like jinn. Kind of, kind of like jinn. Mm. They roam around the lands and they are um, they are individualistic entities. So they live for their own principles and values, okay? Mm. <clears throat> and um, this is uh, the equivalent of this. And if I think about it in Western culture, the equivalent of this is the Lovecraftian gods. Ah, they are yeah. so large that we cannot understand them. Mm. Right, so we have these warriors that, are, that venture too far out into the forest. They meet in Hantu Grassi, and then they 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 get consumed. They get eaten, whatever it is. My my creature on mm. here mm. is a giant that is apparently the most malicious and evil one. Mm. And I think if I remember correctly, the exact name is like Hantu Grassi Papa Jum Nawa, or something like that. What Which does it, what does it mean? Translates to um, giant soul stealer. Oh shit! Right, <laughs> that's how called. <laughs> older, older words, older Iban words that we don't use anymore. But it says like uh, absorber of life or soul stealer. Damn! Cetera, right? And it's like the most malicious giant creature ever. Right. So we have this, and we etch it on our shields because we want to point it outwards. In mm. case another village sees us and sees, 
oh shit, this is a person who worships the most evil, malicious god, giant thing ever. They're going to fucking kill us. Like that's pretty much like how it is. Mm. Now, here's the thing. If you are a fan of Cartoon Network, this giant looks like Aku from the movie or the show Samurai Jack because um, Iban motifs in tattooing are actually very, very young. 200, 300 years old because the Iban tribe took tattoo motifs or understandings of tattoo teachings from the Kayan tribe, which are further up north of Borneo. And the Kayan tribe took them from Balinese tattooing or Filipino tattooing or Maori tattooing. So if you know that the animator for Samurai Jack actually took inferences, influences from Balinese tattooing to build the character, that's Aku. Aku, right? That is Aku. Yes, yeah. that is Aku. Yeah, it does look like it. Yeah. Then you will know Jeez. that when you see my arm and shoulder, you'll be like, oh shit, this guy's a Samurai Jack fan. I'm like, no, the fuck not. It's not a Samurai Jack fan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this is the most evil giant ever. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much how it is. So we have different levels, levels yeah. of spirits. And these are the ones that, um, maybe the, the correct term in English, they are deemed as monarchs, like royalty. They cannot be commanded by anyone else. Mm. If you encounter them, you will die. So we want to instill that fear into other people that we will battle mm. so that we can take down their defenses before we raid them. And that's how that's it's on like our a psychological thing. You, yes. want to f you want to create fear. It's like Batman. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. No, exactly. Like you you're, become you're right. you become the very thing that yeah, you that want. You yeah, 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 yeah. No, that, that's true. Yes. Yeah. Wow, that's that's, how it that's is. quite that's quite poetic. Yeah. But I mean, to add on to the whole like samurai Jack thing, Aku, I think Wayne would appreciate that because I, I'm sure he he likes samurai Jack as well. But the fact that you know, like a lot of things that we see on you know uh, pop culture or this non uh, all this fiction work right actually they come from somewhere they come from someone's culture they come from a lot of places yes. um, yeah, in fact Bram Stoker's Dracula came from Vlad the Impaler the guy like likes to chop people's head off and then put them on sticks right so it, it all comes from somewhere which is the amazing thing about like folkloric tales yeah I mean and to tangent to that right do you have any more ghost stories? <laughs> no, I, okay. For us. I, I, ha I have one and I would love your take on this. Okay. okay, let's go. So this is not on me. This is on a close family friend sure, of mine. Sure. Have, sorry, actually it's my cousin actually. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to anonymize this person's name. So let's, let's call him, uh, let's call him Bob mm -hmm. for an example. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Bob is Iban mm -hmm. from the same longhouse. Mm -hmm. Grew up in the longhouse. Mm -hmm. Okay. Unlike me, I was, I'm, I'm a very city Iban person. Mm. He is from the longhouse himself. Like mm. he stayed in the longhouse for a very, very long time. Okay. Mm. Bob is Iban mm. ethnically, but he's also Indian. Oh, okay. And I don't, I don't know if this will play a part, but I'll just let you know mm. information. Okay. So when you put us next to each other, we don't look like we're related where we are. So mm. we're cousins, okay. So he studied engineering in a university, a local university in Malaysia, in West Malaysia. One day, and this is very, very recent, two years ago, I believe, before before lockdown. So I'd mm. say maybe two, three, four years ago. Mm. He um, finished a semester of uni. He's doing engineering. Mm. And then he decided to take a trip to Malacca mm. with two or three of his friends. Mm. He has a hobby of photography. Mm. So he likes to take pictures and post it on Facebook and whatever, which is cool. You know, just like anybody else. Here's what happened. He went on a trip to Malacca mm. for maybe two or three days. Mm. And then he came back very different. Mm. He came back to the uni and he went back to his dorm. He lives in his dorm with his little brother. Mm. So my other cousin. And then my other cousin started messaging us and especially their mother and my aunt that Bob is acting a little bit different. When he came back, he started becoming more quiet because he's normally a very extroverted person, but he started talking in a specific corner of the room. 
Mm. Like having conversations with someone who doesn't exist there, arguing with them, shouting with them. And then eventually it went from talking with this person to forgetting other people around him. He actually forgot the name and face of his own mother. He forgot the name and face of his own brother. And the extended family of his uh, father couldn't remember him. Uh, he couldn't remember them as well. So the mother took drastic measures, took him to a hospital. He went to a hospital. And he was, it turns out that he was getting memory loss like medically. He did an x-ray scan of his brain. And it turns out that there was a liquid growing in the front part of his brain. The, um, I, I believe what they call it white matter lesion, I believe, L-E-S-I-O-N. I believe that's the name of the, the medical term for it. But basically it's this like liquid that grows on the front and then it affects the neurons that, uh, that, that aid to memory. So mm. he starts forgetting very, very important information. Mm. It starts growing and he's stuck there. She's my, my aunt is trying her best to make sure that he's, her son is okay, brings her food, etc. but he just forgets who she is. He thinks that she's just a helper. Mm. And she's trying to find an explanation for all of this because this is such a drastic behavior change that she doesn't understand. So she looked through the pictures of his trip. So it was a trip with his friends, a few friends in the same class, a few girls, whatever, whatever. And then he, she saw a picture, a very particular picture. It was a very, very beautiful picture. I mean, if I show you the picture, it looks like a really nice, like stock photo. It's of a picture and behind it is a sunset. Mm. And then she, um, her, the color from her face drained. And my other cousin, the younger brother of Bob said, what's wrong? And she said, oh, that's a karak tree, which is a pokok karak or karak tree in Malaysia. If you know, if you're Malaysian, you'll know that if you go to the Karak Highway or the, the like Jalan Karak, mm. it's a specific tree that grows on that highway. And if you go there past sunset, apparently it's a very popular space or place for spirits to attend. Mm. So you should never be on that road past sundown. And he took a picture as the sun was setting, which meant that he was present during near that Karak tree. But it was Malacca, right? Malacca? Yeah. Yeah. But not near Karak. Karak is near to KL, if I'm not wrong. I mean, I mean, it's the name of the tree. So I'm not sure if that meant like a regional, mm. uh, a regional species of the plant or that, oh, this is a, this is a species that like would attract spiritually in some, in some capacity. Mm. Then. But she believed that that was the cause. Mm. So ever since then, because there was no other picture that he took that led it, led to any spiritual explanation. Mm. So I I don't really know myself. I mean, I would love to like I, I would love to like you know, find out other explanations, but that's, that's how it is. And because of this, she believed that he was possessed or affected by something that led to the growth of something in his brain. Because when they took the x-ray scan of his brain, this was a liquid that grew in the corner of his brain that led to a memory function and memory creation that did not have any proper explanation as to how it got created in the first place. Mm. White matter lesion tends to be a liquid that grows in the brain due to aging, which leads to premature symptoms of dementia. Jeez. But he is the guy that's like younger than me. It's like mm. a few years younger than me. I mean, 27. He's, he's young. He's, la. he's, he's young, young, yeah. So it's very rare for these kinds of signs of dementia to even appear. So how did they solve it, the issue? He had to go through surgery. They had to get a laser mm. to laser the, the liquid off of his brain. Mm. And after two months of recovery, on one day when she came in, aunt came in to give him like quick or some food or something, he suddenly remembered, oh, you're my mother. 
Mm. And then he start slowly remembering, slowly remembering. So his lecturers, his teachers, were informed about the whole situation, and then they gave him an automatic pass so that he can pass through without anything because this is such a strange case, and he had to recover for a long time. Now, as I'm explaining this. This sounds like something that's really, really far away because it's kind of hard to resonate with this, right? Yep, yep. So, and 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 I, if you if you're thinking about this way, and for anyone here who's thinking about this way, I would agree with you because I will also be like, you know, are you sure this is real? This sounds like some Ripley's episodes and bullshit. <laughs> but, but there is something that convinced me otherwise, and that is I met him a year after. I've known this guy for 20 years, and suddenly he comes in, and he meets up with myself and also my family and our big family we got for a huge gathering he's like the most extroverted guy ever mm -hmm. but for this moment maybe a few years ago he's like so quiet mm. so shy yeah so reserved in everything he says and i said i asked him like how are you doing recently and then he was like yeah, you know i'm fine but i feel like killing myself Jeez. and i'm like yeah and i'm like are you okay like what are you up to and he's like no there's Everything's perfectly going fine in my life. It's just sometimes there's these voices that tell me I need to end it. And so yeah. I had to like talk to him throughout the time. I'm like, you know, I don't know, use some dark humor or something. It scares the shit out of me. Oh, shit. So he's doing fine now. I do check on him once in a while. I asked his parents, etc. Uh, his mom, etc. Like his, his father's not in the picture, but um, he's doing fine. Mm. Um. And he's doing okay career-wise, but he has been permanently affected. He's not as bright and bubbly as before. He's not as loud as before. He's a bit more reserved and he's a bit more careful. And sometimes I wonder, is this a medical thing that happened or is this a spiritual thing that happened? So, Damn. Yeah, it's crazy. So it's permanent. permanent. I mean, but he remembers everything now. He remembers everything before then. Mm. But so, so but why why haven't the family like seek any like religion to help like spiritual advisors, um, you know? So uh, as as a context or as a background context, um, a lot of the Ebans converted to Christianity. Yeah, yeah. after the missionaries it, yeah. came in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but but this felt like there was something way beyond any Christian influence. There was no one that could ever help but they did they did they try, did try yeah they did because try. they tried to bring as many people who would be able to explain or provide some kind of remedy but yeah but does he still see people that are not there no uh, I, I think he's he's it's either that he does and he's not telling us mm. or he is he's recovering um, or that he has become, as a result of this entire experience, become a little bit more sensitive to a different plane of dimension that we do not understand. So he won't tell us. I don't think anybody can understand. Yeah, sure. I don't think anybody can truly understand that the things are beyond. I've always said this on the podcast is that my theory is that the supernatural beings that we see, that we claim to see, are probably aliens. Or... Yeah an alternate reality hmm. that, you know, like how like the string theory, right? Yeah. Like it's stacked on, each reality is on top of each other. And then sometimes there is a gap and then you can see it. It's just another reality. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, I, either we, we have the science to understand it and like maybe, you know, the power that be are like, yeah, we don't, we don't want to let people know, you know, like it's going to change things big time. So let's just keep it under the wraps. Like, if you if you believe in aliens, I think it's not too far to say that you believe in the supernatural because it's very very close, right? Yeah, like I do believe in aliens. Yeah. So speaking of aliens, right? Yeah. <laughs> Have you watched the documentary called The Skinwalker Ranch? No. Do, do you know about skinwalkers? Right. I do know of the skinwalkers. Yeah. yeah. So um, the Skinwalker Ranch is basically this ranch in uh, in. The, in I think, I, I'm not sure if it's Midwest America, but in America, where there's a lot of weird happenings, like supernatural, like uh, extraterrestrial, it's a lot of activities. 
So it, it, you, you should check it out. It's really, really interesting. Like they base, it's an investigative documentary that brings out evidence and, you know, like interviews people. So it's basically like a mashup between aliens and supernatural. Okay. Because the skinwalkers, you know, like even by mentioning their names, you're giving them power. That's how like, it's kind of like Miss P, right? Like you don't want to mention his name after sundown, but skinwalker is all the way. So skinwalkers are basically uh, witch men uh, who practice voodoo and black magic that have turned into uh, supernatural beings that they are kind of like werewolves. Like, yeah. Basically they can turn into anything. They can shape shift, they can morph and oh, then shit. they will kill people. Yeah, it's just supernatural beings. Lah. So, and then somehow it got related to aliens in that documentary. Like, oh, it's creepy. Do you believe that there are extraterrestrial creatures walking amongst us now? Yes. Hmm. I do. I think that they are either microscopic. Oh, interesting. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's a, okay. Yeah. yeah. They I could never be much, about that. Yeah, yeah, okay. much more small. There was a theory that they are microscopic or small enough. Uh, or mm, the, if you want to put on your team for hats, like they have managed to assume uh, certain positions in the human government. So that, you know, they make certain policies that lead to the eventual departure of Earth. Something like that. Like Interesting. Okay. There's, there's a lot of okay. theories, right? Like, but I do believe they are amongst us. Um, recent events have shown that we are heading towards that trajectory. Uh, I think it's because of the advent of technology and social media. It's harder to hide these kind of things. Like, like, okay, so like we, we were talking about, like we were talking with uh, the guys from uh, Yamcha Sessions, right? We we're talking about like ghost footages. We live in an age where there's 8K cameras, right? Yes. When you look at paranormal activities footage, it's always shitty grinning cameras that you can barely see. Right? We, have, we have iPhones that can capture in 4K raw now. Right? So, so I think, I don't know. I think the whole idea of men in black may not be so far-fetched. There could be an agency, that an in, in inter-government agency that is like cleaning all this mess up. And with the advent of phones, do you think people are not able to capture things? We still get like crap, right? That's online, that's like 360p. And they're like, oh, sighting of, I don't yeah. know, Pochong. Why is it a sighting isn't never HD? Exactly. That's annoying me actually. The, yeah, as a filmmaker, a that's my question, right? Yeah. Right. There must be someone who's like, you know what? Take this down, take this down, take this down. We will declassify in 50 years time. Yeah. Right? They, they declassify a lot of stuff recently, yes. right? Yeah, footages of like UFOs and stuff from the Navy. So yeah, it's not that far off to say that, yeah, they're amongst us. It's just that the, the powers that be, they are choosing their time and place to control the narrative. But we, I mean, today's episode, we're just like barely scratching the surface. Yeah. Yeah, right? So bring us back to Supernatural. As a Malaysian, why do you think, you know, Malaysians are so fascinated with the Supernatural? Why? Yeah, yeah, why? Oh my God. Never thought about that, actually. It's just become normalized in Is a lot it? of conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like- the, Okay, what do you mean by normalized? Sure, so normally when something gets normalized in a conversation, and we're thinking about this from a humanities point of view, right? <clears throat> One, we have the general informal influences that affect us, mm. which is, you know, rumors, family stories, etc., passed down ancestral mm. lore, whatever. The second is media. Mm. So we have multiple angles in which this kind of specific topic gets ingrained into our normal daily conversation. When we think about I, I don't know about it happening in Singapore, uh, so someone can totally <laughs> correct me wrong if I'm wrong, right? And 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 this is very much more apparent for me because I was sure. in boarding school in KL, sure, right? Sure. So we had a lot of ghost stories in in boarding school. Okay. And I guess I should talk about it in the episode. But I forgot about it until now, but um, we had a lot of ghost stories in boarding school. So students getting possessed. Yeah. Or um, what do you call that? Orang minyak. Oh, I think yeah, yeah, or, yeah, or, yeah, or, yeah, or like yeah. Toyol. Yeah, Toyol. Like, yeah. yeah. So we see them at the edge of like the the boarding house and we see like this figure. We don't know who that person is. And then Shit. when we check the area, it's like, 
we don't know, we, no one was there, and but we see like a footprint of oil, or, you know, like like crazy stuff like that. Mm. But we have really easily, easy to understand explanations for each of these occurrences, these mm. phenomenons. Yeah. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna say phenomenons because I want to really, uh, I really want to distinguish them from from what is seen to be rational explanations sure. for what these what these are. So these are normalized because we hear them from oral stories growing up. We hear them from a very multicultural society in Malaysia, where uh, not only Dayaks but also other other sub, uh, other cultures within Malaysia that have that have stories that do not exactly involve every single sense being activated sure. in them, right? Yeah. So supernatural or perceptive or whatever it is. And now you, when talking to another Malaysian, can expect that the conversation, when they bring up something that is supposedly supernatural from a rational point of view, would just be accepted. Like you wouldn't question it. Like when someone says like, yeah, yeah, I mean, something happened and just, just some orang minyak like tried to steal my underwear or something and they'd be like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, okay, whatever. And you walk away. <laughs> but then if you're not Malaysian, you'd be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, you know, like you just like question it. Exactly. So there's a certain culture shock element to it. Mm. If you're within the culture, it's not a shock. Mm. You don't question it. Mm. It's normalized. You've heard the word Pontiana. Yep. You've heard the word like Orang Minya. You've heard the word Toyol. Yeah. Like you've heard like, you know, of X word related to something supernatural. Yeah. You've heard these words that as a term and as a definition summarize something that you cannot explain. Yeah, pretty much. To someone outside of say, Southeast Asia. Yeah. Try to explain to someone who is not Southeast Asian is a Pontiana. Yeah, it's, it's it's pretty. Yeah, it's that's hard, right? Yeah, it's hard. It's hard, right? It's hard. It's so, hard. so we normalize it because normalization in this context means we technically have given up on clear cut definitions of a phenomenon. Mm. So, in short, like, would you say that, like, because actually the 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 basis of supernatural stories, ghost stories. Uh, and explain, explaining certain things and events through the happenings of supernatural events, right, uh, are ingrained in our culture. Would you say that actually Southeast Asians are pretty good storytellers? Your yeah. Average, yeah, I would like say. We yeah. would just like sit down at the mama, hey bro, I tell you that day, right, I go and park my car. And then I saw Pontianak standing on the, the other car there, you know, and then I ran and I ran and then I ran the red light, then I cannot summon. You know, like, Random stories and then you just I, I, I got an, I got another one. You just reminded me of another one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. My brother was this is my brother's story, not me. Okay. okay. I have an older brother. He went back to Miri, I believe. Mm. Oh, no, sorry, Kuching. 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 He went okay. he went back to Kuching. Then he was with his three friends from high school back when he was studying in Miri because we used to live in Miri growing up, so he was in, in class or high school back then. Okay. Mm. Four of them all in high school or like older, they were friends in high school and then they met up again. They go through a graveyard because obviously it's a setting for a fucking like crazy supernatural story, right? Chinese, Muslim, Indian, Christian? Uh, most of them were, they're all Chinese. Oh. All the other friends. No, as in like the, the cemetery itself. Oh, multi, multi, multicultural. Oh, okay. So it was definitely more multicultural in terms of like graveyard presence. Oh, so that's okay. okay. Yeah, no, no, we accept all ghosts <laughs> of different cultures <laughs> in, in, nice. in, 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 uh, in Sarawak. Anyway, we, they, he goes through this Jeez. graveyard. I don't know why I wasn't there, but he told me after. He goes through this. And nothing happens throughout the whole time going through this. This was at night, right? At night. Okay. Yeah, like uh, 2 a.m. Oh, uh, after, after drinking at a bar or something okay, like that. Okay, okay. okay. Yep. And then he goes through. And at the end, right when he got to the exit of the graveyard, mm. his phone buzzes. Jeez. Like a vibrate, vibrate, message vibrate. Okay, he leaves. It was a call, uh, it was a message, SMS from an unknown number. And then it said, Bole perkenalan. What does that mean? Bole perkenalan. It means, uh, can I get to know you? Oh, damn. At the graveyard. Bro. Okay, at the graveyard. Okay. Okay. And then he sped like motherfucker. Okay, they sped away. All right. However, if you think about that story mm. and you think about the shock factor of that story mm. and try to imagine that in the UK. 
mm. or Australia or the US. Mm. If it happened in those other places, then it would definitely be a lot greater of a shock. Yeah. Right? If you go to Australia and you're sitting and you're with your fucking mates and you go through a graveyard and you're like, and you suddenly get a message from some random person, you're like, oh, fucking, how's it going? Fucking, wah, 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 wah. and then you're like, oh, fucking, fucking, do a fucking smash. You know, you go away and you drive. But there are ways to counteract the, uh, the feeling that you get from that experience. And there are ways to further amplify because it's such a rare case. Mm. But in Southeast Asia, it is, it is easier to accept. Mm. I would say to answer your question, Southeast Asia are some of the best storytellers of horror and the supernatural. Yeah. But that is evidence of the fact that we have the most common cases <laughs> Yeah. of the supernatural cases, yeah. of, of, of these supernatural horror stories, because we're so used to it that to a certain degree, compared to other regions around the world, yeah. these are quite normalized in our lexicon, our dictionary of I, understanding. I would say the, the irony is, is that we are normalized to it, but we have not accepted it. You, you know what I mean? Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I've been to Europe, they, they do ghost tours. Yes, yeah, they do. Right, yeah, but like in Southeast Asia, you don't see people. Oh, hey, let's go, let's do a karak ghost story. Everybody's like, Hey, you crazy, yeah, later you're gonna kill you. Know? <laughs> wait, wait, okay, I got a question. I got a question. Sure, question. let's go. Okay, okay, you said these Europe tours, yeah, okay. Do you find European ghosts more scarier than Southeast Asia? Oh, easy, like Southeast Asian ghosts, right? I went to one and then I was like, Bro, Porter guys only, right, bro. right, 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 yeah. And so, so I ask you, okay, why the cultural ignorance. Simple cultural ignorance. I, I don't understand their culture. Uh, therefore, I feel like I'm protected because I don't know. Like, like, like for example, right, like, oh, we know that during Hungry Ghost Month, you, you don't kick the incense. Yes. You, you respectfully walk, right? Yeah. <laughs> like in Singapore, when we are serving national service, we don't go to the camp. We don't bring in pork because some of the camps are built on Muslim burial grounds. You bring in pork, the spirits will haunt you. We know that. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, because that's a cultural thing, right? Yeah. But when you're, you're essentially, you queen essentially the Kuailo of the Kuailo's country. <laughs> you you, you, you don't just, know. You just reminded me of another story. Yeah. Um, yeah. So a fun story for everybody here. Uh, so I, like I mentioned, I was in boarding school. Right. So when I went back to- uh, In KL. In KL. Okay. Yeah. So I, I uh, when I was young, we, we moved to Europe for a few years and then after that we came back. Mm. And then uh, when we came back, I went to, I went to boarding school. Not necessarily in KL, but like in, in Selangor, Mantin, mm, which Selangor, is like a, yeah. quite a distance away from KL. Our biology teacher found a skull. Jeez. And uh, we, I, I saw the skull. Like it was- it, the, Where? Uh, it was one of the grounds or the yards or the gardens behind one of the boarding houses. Wait, your biology actually dug it out? Yeah, yeah. For what? Why? Why would sh your biology? No, 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 no. It, it was because it was because um, someone reported it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Someone reported it, and then the biology teacher was like, "Oh, okay, cool." And then it turns out that she was um, responsible for handling it, etc., etc., etc. And so we found a skull, and it was a human skull. Okay, I saw it. Shit. And then uh, it turns out uh, that behind our boarding house, we found the answer as to why the trees behind. The trees behind our house grew a lot larger than other trees oh, nearby other boarding okay, houses. Yeah, I see where this because is. <laughs> our boarding school was built on top of a POW camp during World War II. Right. So we don't know how many bodies were actually built on that. So, okay. like I mentioned before, like I mentioned about the Toyos, the oil miniat. Yeah. A lot of those stories happen in the boarding school. So, so did, have you had any sightings? For me, no, oh. but I did see the skull that was mentioned. So you actually saw it. We went to the back room. I saw the skull. Oh. She was handling it. She had gloves. She was like, she was brushing it off, etc. Oh, so they were waiting for the cops or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they were make, waiting for someone to like, like handle the Damn. burial or something like that. But then we saw it. Yeah, because we took a break from biology class to like take a look at the skull and then, etc. Yeah, she turned it into a lesson basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, <laughs> yeah. it was like, oh, it's science people. It's like, like, let's take a look at death, and I'm like, oh shit. Okay. Science people. You're asking man. the Iban person, like, okay, let's Bro, go. <laughs> science people. It's like, oh yeah, that's the Monday. That's Monday to me. Bro. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my house got five. You want to see? Uh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but jeez, yeah, but that 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 is fascinating because. 
I mean, I don't know, like uh, may, maybe the teacher in your school is particularly garang, but in Singapore, <laughs> that would have caused a lockdown in the school, bro. Like that would have like, instantly locked down. The cops will show up. Everything will get yeah, locked yeah. down. Like if you see that in Singapore school, you get traumatized. Then you get like, I don't know, like counseling for like a week. Um, because it's, it's traumatizing. Death is traumatizing. Oh yeah, yeah, it is, it is. To, to the westernized people, right? Yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah, but we're too far away from the city to get support. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. it. Says a lot about the country. Anyway, yeah. Anyway, so yeah. Uh, one thing, one thing that I have to ask for sure yes. is like, as a podcaster, you have done so many shows, right? Have you worked on anything that's of the horror genre? Okay, I have, I have an idea. Horror podcast, horror podcast. Yeah, have you okay. worked on any? So, no, um, no. Okay, I have an idea. I want a, a goal. I do, I do want to work on. Okay, and this is something that. So earlier in this conversation, <clears throat> I did mention Henry Golding was also of the same tribe. Yes. Right, so we have proof. We uh, He does have the- It's very Turang. well documented. It's very well documented. He has yeah. the Bunga Terang on his uh, shoulders. Actually, uh, um, Iban tattoos are actually uh, uh, politically reactive, mm. right? That's a whole other episode. But sure. but in a nutshell, what that means is that um, the reason why it is at it is, at it is now as it is now, is that um, if it's fear-based due to war, a lot of like changes for the warriors and civil, it's like more big, black, and bold. But in nowadays, it's more for aesthetics, right? It's mm. more, it's more for proof of the proof of the maturing of the mind, mm. proof of your journey as a man, proof of your journey as an adult, for maturing from a child to an adult, etc. That's why you have the bunga turung on the front there. For Henry Golding, he has both, mm. and he is even. Mm. He's half Iban, but he is Iban. He does respect his, his, um, his uh, roots. Roots, yeah. yes, that's the best way to put it. I do have this idea where I want to do a podcast with him, where he's the host, and I would produce with him and record everything, where he traces back the roots of his oh, it region. Like fantastic idea. Because his family, I believe, is from Betong and they have a lot stronger of a history and technically so to a certain degree, I think my ancestor is also from the same region. So there is some like personal involvement or personal um, commitment from my end mm. as well. So I do want to do that. But from a horror standpoint, what that means is that there might be some horror points or elements mm. that can only be unlocked if it was Henry talking to his ancient ancestors. Mm. or Henry talking to his great uncles or great aunts. Mm. Because like we mentioned before, a lot of Iban history is oral mm. in nature. Yep, We did not have a proper script. Actually, there was like a point in time when it was like 30, 40 years ago, there was actually an alphabet that was used for Iban script, but, but it was lost in a flood or something like that. So yeah. there was this, there's this one scholar in Sarawak who's trying to like recover and like put it all together. But we're not still we're still not using it in, in proper like proper discourse today. So we can't really use that for now. But then if I were to start a show on horror genre, I'd be doing it with him at the helm. I will be in the back. I'd be the one doing the recording. And the way that I would do it would be it would be very similar to us right now. It would be like maybe there's some sections where uh there are two hosts, but then I'm leading the direction and then he answers. Mm. And I put the recording there, the microphones, etc. And then he talks with his uncles or his great aunts or his ancient cousins or whatever and they hear some stories. We then hear elements of horror from a culture, not from the point of like jump scare or like trying to introduce some terror, but more so horror from centuries of history. Mm. And to me, sometimes when you listen to something that has hundreds of years of weight mm. that has greater value to scare you than anything else. That's just a gimmick that you see on film. Mm. So yeah, that's, that's like a goal show that I want to do. I know it's going to be a long list, but I have to ask what are, what are some of your favorite horror movies, books, and even games you can, you can have like all three, Jesus. maybe try to keep it to two for each <laughs> type. 
Okay, I, I mentioned fourth kind earlier. I don't know if that counts as horror. Is, I'll just I'll just say it's yeah. a different kind of horror. Yeah. Um, I I will preface this as uh, I'm not a fan of jump scares. Um, Fair enough. I yeah. feel that any movie that that depends on jump scares to give me an experience is a failure. It's cheap, lah. Yeah. It's cheap. Yep. Yeah, it's cheap. Like you said, yeah, that's probably the better way to to yeah. to describe it. Um, and this is coming from someone who really appreciates the deep history of something that could potentially be scary. Mm. So let me, let me think. I say that, but then I'm going to say the answers I might actually give might be completely different. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. So um, if you like video games, uh, the fear series is a very big one. Oh, Yep. The the one where you're mercenary and then it's that the lady goes that follows yep. you. Yep. Oh, terrified me. When first, uh, for, uh, first encounter assault recon. I think that's the name of the fear series. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Alma, um, who is basically like American Juan. Mm. <laughs> it's, yeah. So like fear one, two, three. Uh, I, I did not play that. I watched my friend play that in yeah. boarding school. I went back to Malaysia. Yeah. Um, Play one and two, those are scary. Don't play number three because number three is not that scary. Actually, uh, the ghost becomes your wife. Mm, so, so weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it becomes really crazy, but basically that's that's one thing. Um, that's a good way to, to, to start off with. I'm trying to think of other horror movies. Books as well. Books. So, maybe, maybe not books at the moment, um, but uh, but podcasts oh, yeah. uh, would be good. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Indian Noir is a big one. Um, I mean, that's a really, really good start. I need to check that out. To, yeah, yeah you, you should check that out. Um, a lot of it is true crime. I, I, so maybe depending on your interests, you might want to pick specific series. I do I do listen to true crime podcasts as yeah. well. Yeah, so if you mix in between that, it's perfectly yeah. fine. Um, and you can just jump into any episode as long as you start from the beginning of a specific series. It's perfectly fine. Sure. Um, that's one, Indian Noir. He did, uh, the the podcaster did release a book that is horror themed, horror genre, as a result from his acclaim from that podcast. Mm. And it was just released like a few months ago. Mm. So there is that book as well. I'm actually gonna talk about it in tomorrow's talk. Okay. So. This is brilliant. Yeah, so I, I will, if, if there's anything, I, I could probably like put the name of the book in the show notes. Sure, sure, yeah, 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 yeah. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I will talk about the book uh, tomorrow. Um, it's I believe it's a collection of short story horror tales from the podcast itself. From the podcaster himself, yep. um, not brilliant. necessarily derived from the show, but maybe from his influences, etc. Because he um, derives a lot from Indian horror, Indian spirits and ghosts, mm. and supernatural, but also from other big market, places yeah. as well. So yeah. Um, so those are big ones. I can't think of another horror recommendation because I'll be honest, I'm not yeah. a horror fan. And here's the reason why. <laughs> I have enough horror in my life <laughs> growing up to seeing these skulls. I've normalized that. Yep. Um, so I get that. The yeah. main reason why I, I am very averse against horror, even though I love talking about it. Yeah. I love talking about it. Yeah. Right? is because every time there's anything that's horrific that comes to my attention, it's not that the thing scares me, is that every time it plays a trick against me, it reminds me of what I know from my own culture or my mm. own tribe, and that scares me more. Mm. So every cheap gimmick from a Western horror movie is a reminder of what is truly horrific for me. Mm. And that scares me a lot. Strangely enough, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. It can be anything, no shame, um, but what scares you the most? Let me set the context, okay? It can be anything like really stupid. Like Wayne and I, we're big men, right? But when we are horror creators, but we are terrified of house chichas. Like I'm telling you, oh. if you throw a house chicha right on my face, I will scream so hard. So it can be anything. Yeah. So you never watched like Chicha Man? I mean I watched Chicha Man, but like I just even don't. one, two, three. I, 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 I watched one and okay. I was like, this is stupid, but I love it. <laughs> uh but that was before my whole chicha 
thing manifested okay. for some reason. It just manifested. So yeah, there are, we are terrified of chicharts. Um, yeah, so what scares you the most? I do have a deepest fear. It's not exactly horror. No, it doesn't have to but be. But yeah. it doesn't have to be. But I'll tell you, my deepest fear is memory loss. Uh, okay. Um, we have a history of dementia in the, movie, in the family. And my grandfather got hit by it. And this happened before he passed away. He, his memory degraded to when he was a child. Okay. So yeah. my greatest fear is memory loss. Because if I can't remember how I lived beforehand, I can't tell if I was actually truly alive. So if there was actually a creature out there that's going to scare me right now, but then after a while, they're going to eat my memory. My greatest fear is the moment years later where I will try to remember, oh, what happened in 2023 when I had this conversation with Kyle? <laughs> and then I can't fucking remember what I said. Or I can't remember what happened. Or I ask you and you can't remember it as well. I can't tell if I was truly alive and I will live the end, I will live the rest of my life full of regret. Not mm. at whether or not I can remember, but the regret that I forgot. Just to share with everyone who is watching, where can we find you online? Yeah, oh, sure. Pluck, 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 pluck yourself. Yeah, sure. So I have a blog called thatsthenorm.com. Um, I write a lot uh, on there. Um, if you'd like to find more about me in a nutshell, because I did talk about the podcasting stuff, yeah, and yeah. whatever, whatever. Um, you can find my first name and my last name in a website called normancella.com. I turned that into a ba basically a business card. Mm. It's just a summary of everything that I do. Mm. So that's an easier way to do it. Um, it has a list of all my shows. It's a list of all the things that I do um, from a professional capacity to a personal capacity because my goal is to be very professionally informal. Mm. Mm. Well put. Yeah, otherwise uh, I wouldn't be swearing. <laughs> 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 or talking about my stuff, like my family stuff. So, yeah. Everything will be in the show notes down below. Yep. Yeah, so um, I mean, lastly, before we let you go, what's next? Any like upcoming projects that you want to mention or talk about? Yeah, so um, we, uh, I, I think you talked about this in the intro in the very beginning. I'm writing a romantic memoir. Yeah, um, yes. So that is uh, actually very relevant to our very last discussion there. Um, it's about a relationship that has already happened, but I learned a lot of lessons from it. So a lot of lessons on intimacy, connection, etc. And there's a period of time where I uh, had memory loss. So mm. I do not remember 2019. Mm. If you tell me to remember 2019, I can't remember anything um, because of a traumatic experience during then. So I will share a lot about that in that book. And I will um, potentially write a lot more books and online courses around podcasting as well, awesome. mainly because of my perspective as a podcast librarian. There are a lot of things that I feel that I have, I think the unique access to, mm. and I want to release that out to the public. So for anyone interested in starting a show, continuing a show, or learning more about the industry and navigating in a way where it does not overwhelm you, because trust me, I don't want it to overwhelm you. It should be a fun hobby, a yeah. fun pursuit, a fun passion. Yeah. Um, I will create it in a way where it's accessible to everybody here. Yeah. So yeah, I will have that in the next few months. Yeah, we'll share it when it comes out. Uh, Norm, Norm is actually a great guy to talk to about podcasting. He's even like, he's a veteran, even as compared to us. We are like, what, four, five years in and our podcasting journey is much, much longer. So <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, uh, feel free to learn from him. Uh, and thank you so much for coming to our show and all, of course coming all the way to Singapore. Uh, <laughs> not just for us, of course, like, but coming to our show. Um, so now I'm going to do the closing. It's going to be a lengthy one. <clears throat> Check. Oh, I Wayne always does this, but I, I, I want to learn how to do it. Okay. New episodes of Ghost Maps go online every second and fourth Thursday of the month on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and all major platforms. <laughs> New episodes of Dead Air go online every 13th of the month on YouTube. To make sure that you never miss an episode of either, subscribe to us now and follow us on social media at We Are Hantu. That's one word, W-E-A-R-E-H-A-N-T-U. Lastly, if you would like to share your own ghost stories and inspire future episodes of Ghost Maps, you can reach us through the contact form on hantu.sg or message us directly through Facebook or Instagram. You can also be one of our supporters on Patreon at patreon.com slash wearehantu. And then this is our classic sign-off without Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> and remember 
just because they are stories, it doesn't mean they are not true. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you, Norman. All Bye. Right. Take care. See ya. If you want to stay up to date on Hantu and listen to our other podcasts like Ghost Maps, subscribe now and follow us on social media. You can also be one of our supporters on Patreon. Look for We Are Hantu or click the links in the description. Dead Air is a Hantu production, hosted by Kaya Ong and Win Ray, with album art by Jolin Lim and recorded on Audio Technical Mics. <laughs>